This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks coming at you Thursday afternoon. It's April 18th. And on today's show, I am excited to have Wolves beat writer Chris Hine to join us to discuss his uh, great feature story on Nas Reed that dropped at uh, StarTribune.com on Wednesday. But in the first segment here, it's going to be me solo, and we're going to hit on a topic that I think is the number one sort of swing factor in this Wolves series, and that is Ant's ability and willingness to continue to trust his teammates, even when Phoenix is daring him to do just that. It's They're messing with his mind in ways with this coverage. Uh, we had media availability with Ant on Wednesday afternoon after practice, and what he said kind of... Uh, just brought some things full circle to me in in my head, and we'll uh, we'll get into all that in a second here. But quickly, uh, before uh, we we jump into Ant, I, I wanted to mention again that tomorrow on Friday we will be at Falling Knife Brewing Company uh, for a live show. Myself, Britt Robson, and Kyle Tige. It's gonna be six p.m. Uh, for a happy hour. Um, kind of while we we get set up, we'll do a seven p.m. live show. I'm really just gonna make it. We'll do a little open and just a ton of questions. Whatever questions you have, uh, just come bring them and ask them. And and me, Kyle, and Britt will respond to those. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll hang out for a while afterwards. It's Friday night. Uh, to, there's the Kings-Pelicans play-in game. Uh, we'll be showing in the brewery on, on Friday night after we're done, so we can uh, all watch that together. Uh, we just want you to get to know uh, Falling Knife this postseason. It's become a place where Wolves fans gather uh, to, to watch Wolves games or have gathered there throughout the, the regular season. And I'm excited, uh, yeah, for, for Falling Knife to be able to host that for the playoffs, for you to be able to experience that. Uh, if you're not at Target Center for, for game one at 2.30, I would look on the screen right here. They got a TV truck out there off of their patio. That's an addition to the TVs and the projector screens uh, in, in the tap room there. So I think just hang out at Falling Knife this weekend, Friday night for the live show, where we'll uh, we'll take again a, a ton of questions and and hang out there in the tap room, and then on Saturday uh, for the game, uh, out outside, inside, whatever it, it it should be a blast. That's Falling Knife Brewing Company in Northeast Minneapolis. All right, I, I want uh, to talk about Anthony Edwards here a bit uh, to to open the show because so much of this series comes down to him specifically his ability to to navigate the way in which he handles the way Phoenix uh, is going to guard him in that series. We've talked all week about how they're loading up on him, doubling him, blitzing him, uh, having that gap help on, on both sides at all time. Again, they're just daring him to get off the ball and feel like he's not, he's not doing enough. And I just think that is such a, a fitting test in the greater story of this season for not only the wolf for not only for ant, but for the, the wolves, as a whole, uh, we, we kind of know the, the story of, of the season, right? Um, they, they started off hot. They were, they were eight and two, um, to, to start the season. And by Christmas, they were 22 and six best record in the league tied with Boston at 22 and six at that time at Christmas. And, uh, things were obviously working with the two bigs. Look, the defense was awesome, but Anthony Edwards was also ascending, uh, sort of to, to a new level. And, and it was right around Christmas because of that ascension from Ant the way he was being guarded really started to change. It began looking more and more like what, what Phoenix does to him or has done to him during the regular season and likely will uh, do to him in, in this playoff series, which is that loading up. It's that doubling him again, basically daring him to get off the ball or trudge through heavy help in the lane. And we know uh, on, on Sunday, last Sunday that that strategy worked and didn't respond uh the right well it, it worked back earlier in the season after christmas and didn't uh, respond the right way to to that coverage initially he decided uh, instead of getting off of it he needed to do more he did try to trudge through those loaded defenses which really played right into the defense's hand and i remember i remember ant's sort of confusion with this or kind of progression of thought with it through through the season but the first sort of flashbulb moment to me of this was that first game after christmas again they're 22 and six, 22 and six. And the 29th game of the season was on December 26th. And it was against Oklahoma city and the wolves lose that game by 23 points in part because of the way uh, ant was guarded. It was their worst loss of the season uh, to that point by far uh, because it was the day after Christmas and in Oklahoma city, there's no media there to, to, to cover the game. And I'd be able to ask ant about it after the game. But, uh, but, but two nights later, the wolves were back home for a game against Dallas. And that was the, 
that was the first time we heard the I left bullets in the chamber line from Ant. Here, here's Ant after that, after that game. Find the offense to kind of get into a flow the way that you did. Just shoot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I put it in my mind before the game. Like, I'm probably going to shoot it every time I touch it. So I came in with the mindset that whatever, whatever I was going to do, I was going to do. So. Is that different from other games, or were you just wanted? What what made you have that mindset? Because uh, I feel like last game I left bullets in the chamber, so I ain't want to do that this game. That mentality it uh, it got it got dangerous, and it coincided with the Wolves' first real dip of the season. Uh, the Wolves went eight and seven over their next fifteen games uh, after Christmas, starting with that game in Oklahoma City and the fifteenth game was that loss to Charlotte at home where where Cat actually had 62 points. Uh, the, the Wolves were have been a high turnover team all season. They were before Christmas as well. But in those 15 games, that sort of month um, after, after Christmas, no team in the NBA turned it over more than the Wolves did. And it was in large part due to that mentality that Ant uh, was leaving bullets in the chamber and felt like yeah, he just started, he was forcing it. And the Wolves were turning it over more and more as a product of that. Um, here, here's Ant in the middle of that stretch. This was January 7th, uh, seven games into that skid sort of after after Christmas. Again, bullets in the chamber. Is this one just kind of staying in a different way? Yeah, because uh, I feel like once again, I left bullets in the chamber, but um, I'll take this one for sure. I got to be aggressive down the stretch. Do you, what is like, I mean, you, know, you took a couple shots on the stretch. Do you maybe, you know, maybe like going to the basket a little more? Or? Uh, you know, I, took, like, I took one shot in the last three minutes of the game. Yeah, so I ain't take, what you mean? You talking about when I first checked in? That's not down the stretch. In the last five minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nah, yeah. I, want, I need to take them two minutes left on the clock. So, yeah, that's on me, though. I got to be better. I got to be more aggressive. I can't just, I can't let the double team just make me not aggressive. It was a bad stretch, kind of right there in a, obviously a great season that month of January. Uh, but but things did begun begin to turn from there. After the Charlotte loss, the Wolves went uh, 26 and 16 to to finish the season. Specifically post trade deadline, even after they lost Cat in the middle of that, the Wolves the Wolves finished the season strong. Um, their turnover rate precipitously just sort of dropped uh, from the deadline on. The Wolves actually had an above average turnover rate. And the biggest thing behind that was was Ant's mentality shifting. He let go of the idea that he was leaving bullets in the chamber, and he embraced he embraced ball movement, which the offense collectively uh, really really profited from. I asked Ant about that mentality mentality shift um, sort of happening around around Christmas, and then kind of stabilizing towards the end of the season. Here's what Ant had to say after practice on Wednesday. And when uh, around, around Christmas, after the Oklahoma City loss and after the Dallas loss, you said you felt like you had more bullets in the chamber um, that, that you wanted to, to fire there. And then you kind of like went away from that and said, no, I do actually need to be involved in my team. It's more than you've kind of sustained with that. What, what was the turning point there where you were like, it doesn't need to be you having leaving bullets in the chamber or whatever, that, that feeling? Um, you know what I'm asking? I mean, yeah, I mean, just trusting my teammates, man, because uh, you need them. You, you need your teammates to win a game, um, especially when they guard and how they guard me, man. They put two, three people on me. So, I mean, I feel like the shots that I take are the bullets that I'm going to be able to, you know, let go. And the other bullets that I left in the chamber is for my teammates. And um, if they make those shots, when I find them, when they open, they make those shots, it's going to be hard to beat us. The Wolves need that mentality uh, from Ant to sustain in the playoffs. Obviously, you don't want it to be a, only a seven-shot performance like it was last Sunday. Um, but there's a balance there, and that and finding that balance is going to be tested more than ever by the way we know Phoenix uh, is going to guard him. The way the Wolves win this series is by Ant trusting his teammates, those teammates embracing that opportunity and taking advantage of it. And then Ant, from there, once they've embraced it, once they've shifted the defense, then Ant can profit himself uh, from a defense that at that point won't be able to afford to continue uh, to guard him the way they did during the, the regular season. So I think that's the question. Will will this mentality from Ant that shifted sustain when the playoffs come? We don't know. Uh, but we do know he developed that mentality over the course of the regular season. And I think that is a very uh, noteworthy piece here entering this matchup against the Suns.
All right, we are now joined by Wolves beat writer Chris Hine from the Star Tribune, who just wrote uh, an awesome, awesome feature story on Nas Reed, one of my favorite uh, articles that I've I've read on the, the Timberwolves since I've been uh, covering this team. That is up on the, the Star Tribune's website now. Uh, you won't be able to miss it there. Obviously, you can go to Chris's Twitter feed. But seriously, like, pause this episode right now we're not going anywhere uh go go read the story um and then listen to to chris and i talk about it honestly it'll make the conversation here make a lot more sense we're gonna be talking for a half hour or whatever mm-hmm. go take 10 minutes to to go read that really good work chris uh thank you for, for coming on to talk about it yeah, we we were teasing it when I was in Denver the other day, and I yeah. said, "Well, let's let's My not bad. let's <laughs> not make, let's not make let's not talk about it until it's out." Because yeah. I always feel like until something is actually out, I don't believe it's ever going to come out. So, mm-hmm. thankfully, um, you know, this story got to the finish line. It's in. It's also in print. Uh, this is Thursday, so it's in Thursday's paper. If you want to see the the print copy of it and the design and the yeah. photos and everything kind of all in one package. So I'd encourage people to, you know, go pick up a, a, a paper copy today. If, if also, if you really are interested in, in this as well. Yeah. I mean, the, just the, the layout and graphics here, even on the, the website stuff is, is great. It's, it's yeah. one of those, it's one of those fun stories uh, to see, and to read and i guess chris i'll just tee it up with this which i mean you know you and i have been kind of talking on and off uh about this and you kind of dropped this note to me you know a couple months back um when when i actually i I think i asked you something along the lines of i think when nas had really started rolling and i was like you know nas hasn't really done anything in the playoffs yet right like (laughs) what and that's because last year um last season he breaks his wrist in yep. phoenix um ironically and doesn't play in the playoffs and so his last time in the playoffs playing in the playoffs was against memphis in the 21 22 season and for game six of that series the the final game of that series nasri did not play um, he was not at the game he was out for for personal reasons and the season ends there, right? And we instantly kind of flip over into off season mode or end of season mode and, you know, never really found out why uh, Nas didn't play in that game, wasn't at that game. And, and your story um, uncovers that, what, what Nas's last experience uh, in, in the playoffs was like and why he, why he missed that sixth game of the Memphis series um, for, for an un- unfortunate reason, I guess I'll just kind of let you tee that up. Yeah. So I, I had heard about it at the time, um, that somebody who was close to Nas that, you know, lived in Minnesota, um, had passed away or was very sick. And, and earlier in the series, I, I found out that this person was very sick. And so I always kind of knew this about Nas that he had like some sort of father figure mentor that had passed away. Um, during that Memphis series. And I always kind of tucked in the back of my mind. And I said, well, I, you know, I wonder if, if there's any point in time where Nas is going to maybe want to, you know, talk about that or, or open up about it. So, you know, my, 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 the plan was to just do a large feature on Nas. Like I went to Asbury Park for this. The Wolves played the Nets in late January this season. So after that game, I went to New Jersey basically for like three days mm-hmm. to just try to talk to as many people um, in from Nas's life growing up. And, and, you know, and that was kind of the idea. I didn't know just quite the depth of how much Nas was going to want to talk about his former mentor, Rudy Roundtree. And, you know, thankfully, and during during this process of going to New Jersey, I met Sheila Roundtree, uh, Rudy's wife. Um, and you know, they just, you know, felt comfortable kind of sharing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so the story, you know, there, there were previous iterations of the story and throughout the editing process that had more like color from Asbury park and more scene setting and and other people that I talked to. Um, but when we kind of boiled it down through the editing process, it really just became Rudy and Nas. 
was the was the story and that's what you see online and in print today yes and 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 the story goes into to the audi um i guess to kind of fast forward to to the end of end of it why uh nas missed that game six of um uh, of the playoffs was because that unfortunately rudy roundtree uh his mentor and father figure uh passed away of leukemia uh, that day or yeah the, it, was, the it, was days. Day, it was a day of game six yeah yeah and and so obviously that's um that's why why nas wasn't wasn't able to to be here and i remember you telling me that part of that story but then i mean the way you, you just filled this all in so well and particularly uh tying the the car that that rudy it's funny saying rudy and nas right, it's not, uh, <laughs> right uh, you think of another rudy but yeah yes, this is uh, rudy uh, roundtree and rudy nas roundtree, yeah. uh, took took this car um really really all over the the country in mm -hmm. um after those two met when nas was in was in high school and um, they, they really stuck together. What did, what did, how did that all, uh, flow together? And, I mean, for you, you had to be like, oh man, well, this is a great <laughs> nugget for the story. It's so good. It was so I good. mean, you're always like throughout doing the, the process of, of these stories, you're always looking for like, what is my lead going to be? What is that one thing that is going to hook people into the story? The one detail, the one anecdote, the one story and when sheila told me that she still had the car i was like that's it <laughs> was like that's that's I, I knew right then like that is that's the the big detail the the lead that i want to use because like you still have the car that he used to drive like 10 years ago like yeah. you know all that all that you know all the mileage i said i, I definitely want to know what the mileage is like on that car what let's go see it what's in it we took pictures with her with it you know, one of the pictures is in the story of her standing by the car. Um, so it's it was just a great a great detail, um, you know, to, to that she still had that car, um, right. and I love that. And so getting Nas to just reminisce about being in the car, all the all the trips they used to take in it, um, you know, it was just it was just a great. It's a great starting point and and memory point for for both nas and sheila the fact that that <laughs> the fact that that car is still there too sheila still gets like hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of repairs on it just to keep it running like she does not want to get a new car she probably should have gotten a new car a long time ago right um but nas, she, nas should have got her one well, not, well, that's what he said. You know, I, I, he says, like, I, I've offered to buy them a new car so many times. They don't want it. They want this. They want that Audi. But now it's now it's basically a, you know, a memorial to to Rudy. That car is is a living kind of reminder of of Rudy and, and his life and all that it took to to get Nas to where he is in Minnesota. Because that car, like you said, it went everywhere. It was to and from his practices, to and from school in, in New Jersey, AAU tournaments. Rudy took it to LSU when Nas was at LSU and he moved down there with the with the car, moved it to Minnesota, drove back and forth to Iowa when Nas was in the G League with it, you know, just all all that, all those miles, a lot of them spent on on Nas. I it's often rare to find things relatable in uh in stories with uh with a professional athlete, right? But I think yeah. all of us who played sports at any level can relate to car time. <laughs> right, carpools. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was exactly. some of the some of the best times before and after practice. You know, going and oh, it's so and so's mom's picking us up today. So and so's mm -hmm. dad's driving us home. Um, you know that that's a that's a, a big part of 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 sports is is the the travel to get there and and really mm -hmm. like I think you know I think about for me when I was a kid like so sort of, you know you bond with yeah um, your you know your teammates or even like. I think we we could all say that, like the the parents of our friends who we spent so much time with, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever at a at a tournament together. And I, I just I found myself like stopping in the in the middle of reading your story and being like, oh yeah, the the people I met uh, along the way and just had those extended periods of time with, I could you know sort of envision that and then really see it expand out and where for us, you know, we were maybe driving an hour around. Uh, <laughs> wherever we grew up, Nas and Rudy, um, you know, we're driving that car all around New Jersey, the greater, I guess, New Jersey area when, when he was in high school there, like you said, uh, Nas, I don't know if you said this, but in the story you did, 
Uh, Nas asked Rudy to to move down to him, move down to LSU to Louisiana uh, with yeah. him uh, when when he went there for for his freshman season and. Uh, and then also, you know, they pack, well, they packed up the car to go down there, and then yeah. they packed up the car to to go up to Minnesota and and to Iowa. And I, you know, you just think about Nas being 19 years old when he's at LSU, 20 years old when he is, um, you know, playing basically for the Wolves and the G League team, uh, his his rookie season in the NBA. And you know, for a player that you know, when you're when you're an undrafted player uh, or when you're a player that's in the G league, you just have this like small margin, right. Of, right. of error. Uh, you really need to maximize everything. And um, that really, for me painted more of the story of what one of my favorite things about Nas is, is there's like a discipline to him. There's a commitment to him and mm-hmm. he stayed focused through, it was a rough year at LSU. Like he, he came out, and he was the what I think you said in the story, the number twenty-two uh, recruit in in that class goes to LSU and goes undrafted, you know, yeah. and which, which happens, right? And you kind of need to have people in your corner to you know to keep you moving forward. It's not fun to play mm-hmm. in the G League for players, and I think again from your story I could glean that Rudy kind of kept Nas's eye on the the main thing, and uh, and man, we, we you and I look at like Nas as this massive success story of the Wolves G league team and understanding what it took to play in the G league and to move into the rotation and to climb the ladder. It's cool to see how much, uh, or to understand how much Rudy Roundtree played a, played a role in that happen. Yeah. And you know, his high school coach basically had a quote as saying as much in the story was like that first year, Rudy was really good with Nas and just keeping him focused and trying to have him rise above the frustration of, of not playing in the NBA, of having to play in the G league. You know, it was, I, you know, the, the draft process, I didn't really delve into, into this too deeply in the story. It, it kind of got cut for space, but the draft process was a very, a humbling, I think, experience for Nas and, yeah. you know, not being a first round pick and being a projected second rounder. And, and you know, there was he, he probably could have been a second round pick, but I think, you know, his people, you know, and Rudy included, were trying to maneuver him out of the second round, late mm-hmm. second round so that they could figure out where they wanted to go. And Nas just said, well, I know where I want to go. It's it's whatever the first team is that's going to call me. And that happened to be the Timberwolves. Um, and you know, that, that's kind of how he wanted to handle it. Cause right. it, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the guy Nas is. He's, he's very loyal as people, uh, as people told me. So it wasn't a surprise when he decided to re-up in Minnesota, um, you know, last summer, but yeah, at first it was frustrating. The draft process in his first year was a, was a trying time. And, you know, Sheila said that Nas didn't, did not like being in the G league. You know, it was basically like a waste of his time he felt like in some ways um but he had to go through it and then you know obviously he started getting time with the with the nba club and and things got better from there but yeah it was it was rough going it was rough going that first that first year for sure it it's interesting to you know whatever you just kind of pop in and you're looking you're looking at the wolves right now and you look at the the ages of, mm-hmm. of a lot of the, particularly the, the young players on this team. Obviously, you know, you got, you got Kat who's been here forever. Uh, veteran Rudy was traded here. Mike Conley was traded here, but it's, uh, it's interesting to look at the other young pieces on this team and deservedly the wolves, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for what they did in the draft when they took Anthony mm-hmm. Edwards first overall, Jade McDaniels uh, 28th overall, but, you need more than that, you know, like as good as Edwards and Jaden have, have yep. been, um, you, you needed more. And what I think is interesting about Nas's draft class is, you know, he goes undrafted there and Jarrett Culver is their first round pick sixth overall, you mm-hmm. know, and, and that pick didn't work And and to, to really, to miss on a, you know, a top 10 pick to, to the degree that the wolves did there, you, you normally pay for that for a while. And it's, it's interesting. I wish I would have kind of looked this up. Like, I wonder if we redrafted that class 
how far away Nas Reed right now would be from like sixth. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, think, I, 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 I actually, I, I actually think during the, uh, I was watching the the Bulls uh, Hawks game. Yeah. Last night, and I think they had a graphic up of like the 2019 draft, which okay. was Nas's yeah. draft, and it was like all the picks um, from that draft. And I was thinking to myself, there's not a I mean, there's some players that are still really good from that trip, but there's not a ton. Right. It's he he would be top four. ten. I think he'd be top. Yeah. And for for sure, I think there. so for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, a major major win for the for the Wolves org there for sure. Yeah, that was you know that that basically kind of quote unquote saved that draft class in a way. Yeah. When you're, when you're looking at because if if you took Nas Reed sixth overall and he became what he did today, you'd be like, okay, that was a great. Well, that was a great pick, right? <laughs> that that sure. worked out okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that worked out okay. Um, so just think of Nas Reed as the sixth pick and not and not Jared Culver from that draft. The sixth game. pick and the sixth man of the year. That's right, Na- Nas Reed. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's grab our let's grab our our first break here uh, to to let you know that uh, today's show is uh, brought to you by uh, Adriana Lonick at uh, Coldwell Banker Realty. Um, we we have a handful of uh, sort of housing renovation and mortgage um sponsors here but the real the 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 biggest part of of your home buying process is figuring out what you know what home you want that you want to get into what style of home what fits you and it's really important in that process um to have to have a a realtor who can can help walk you through that that process Uh, adriana lanik is that at, at coldwell banker realty and if you are at that time um, in your life that you're trying to to buy a home, sell a home, um, maybe buy it buy a new home, uh, this is this is someone we want you to con, you know consider working with. Uh, you can go to Adriana's website at thedancingrealtor.com uh, to to get all all information there, um, or you can call or text her at 715-304-9920. Um, it's it's hard to know where to begin. Um, with the the home buying process, and it's it's really helpful to have someone there uh, to kind of uh, take your hand through the process, understand what your needs are in this, and be able to to help deliver that. So please do consider uh, Adriana Lonick um, if you are in the process of maybe buying your first home, selling your first home, or making another home buying process. If you're considering the next steps in home ownership, uh, the place to begin is at the Dancing Realtor. Dot com. Uh, you can see that on, on the screen here, or you can call or text her at 715-304-9920. That's, again, Adriana Lonick at Coldwell Banker Realty. Uh, and then, uh, Chris, I was uh, today's show is also uh, brought to you by uh, by PrizePix, PrizePix.com, PrizePix.com, PrizePix app. They got a bunch up for the uh, for the Wolves, um, first, I guess, game one of the the first round series. And I, I was just, it, it's always interesting to see, you kind of see what everyone's numbers are over the course of the season. And you see how the lines like adjust uh, for, for the playoffs. <laughs> the playoffs like, yeah. I mentioned earlier, like Carl's only at 17 and a half. Obviously he's, he's coming back from injury, but just looking at this often, you know, normally like Carl's number is more or less than like 22 and a half points. He's mm-hmm. at, He's at 17 and a half here. I was just looking at a couple of them that stood out to me. Yeah. Nikhil Alexander Walker, only six and a half points. Um, he's not normally up here at all. They do have him on there, but I'm like, yeah, six and a half. That doesn't feel like many. Jaden McDaniel's number is lower, uh, nine and a half. I think we would all agree he's got to be able to, to do something, score in this series for the Wolves to win. Uh, Ant at five assists. I think if if we know he's going to be guarded the way we think he's going to be guarded, he's probably going to be uh, higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he needs to. I mean, for it to work, he's going to need to get. He's some going assists. to need to get more than five assists. Yeah, yeah. and then you know nothing against Kyle <laughs> Anderson, but I saw more or less than uh, 0.5 turnovers. We know how turnovers have have gone um, in this matchup against the Suns for them. I think it's more likely than not that Kyle has a mm-hmm. turnover uh, in this. But this is just this is just fun, and you got a couple days. Uh, until the game, you can put a put a slate together. Obviously, not just I the Wolves remember, games, but yeah. do, please, do not ask me my advice because I remember the last time I was or one of the last times I was on here, it was the day before the Washington Ant's- game, and we were like, we were like, oh, Ant's playing Washington. He's probably going to go under the point total, right? Right, and yeah. then he goes for fifty. <laughs> 
<laughs> so do not do not listen whenever I have yeah. five picks right. offer on the show <laughs> that are not like Grammys or Emmy yeah right yeah, yeah that's yeah <laughs> do not do not that, that goes to show you that we cannot yeah even even we even though we follow the team we're in the locker room all that shit like <laughs> like oh yeah Ant's going under for the Wizards yeah. nope no he's not he's no. going way over no way no, over. no. Yep. no uh, but you know. All of you have been listening, you've been watching this this team all year. We always say, you know, this isn't a need to break the bank thing, but it's a, I think even just like in the days ahead, like just kind of think about it, you know, matchups and this and that, you know, what do I expect if Durant does this, then their the Wolves are going to do that. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's a fun thing to do to have a little extra on the games. And I also think for the other playoff games, like, you know, Bulls Hawks last night, not the most uh, exhilarating sports viewing experience but it might have been a little bit more fun if i would have had uh, a prize picks late there so yes just always uh, prizepicks.com uh prize picks app promo code dane for a hundred dollar sign up bonus um chris i, mean, I want to continue talking about the story I i'm curious if there are just because i know you spent so much time like you said I, I think this is a cool part of it too for for listeners to understand what goes into a story like this the many people that you interviewed the many places you traveled to to talk to these people to see these people to understand where they're from i'm just curious what sort of things um maybe were were left on the 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 cutting room floor that you feel uh, yeah. comfortable sharing here sure yeah so i like i said i spent a a significant amount of time in asbury park um late january reporting it and i had I had lunch with uh, two of his middle school teachers, uh, Jan McLaren and Sh uh, Sherry Love. And I was really kind of, I, I was hoping I could get this part in the story just because I feel like it's necessary like to, to really know who Nas was growing up, like kind of the relationship he had with, with some of his teachers. And like, like Sherry told a, a wonderful story that I, I wish I was still able to include and it's in the it, uh, let's call it the extended dance remix version of the story <laughs> that exists on my Google Doc. Yeah. Um, but this this great story that she told, she was a Nasa Spanish teacher um, in middle school, and kind of almost like a foreshadowing of his relationship with Rudy. Like he really, you know, Nas really gravitated towards her and, and her family, and he became friends with you know her kids, and so he was always kind of like around her and her house and and hanging out and you know he said whenever he was you know in her classroom you know he felt like a kind of a son to her so it really I, I wanted that in there because it was like very foreshadowing of of kind of his relationship with Rudy that he would get when he was in high school mm -hmm. um and she told this great story and I think this really illustrates who Nas who Nas is as a person that you know her, her daughter unfortunately died in a car accident a, a few years back and you know the, the she was getting you know obviously like you know outpouring of support from the community what she didn't expect was that nas reed nba player at the time was going to fly back to new jersey wow. and surprise visit her at her house just to just to be there with her you know for wow. for a day or two um and then he had to fly back because i think it was the middle of the season or something like that but but nas carved out some time in his busy schedule to to fly home and and just to comfort her you know when she had this terrible tragedy happen in her in her life and I really wish I was able to squeeze that segment into the story but unfortunately that got that got left on the cutting room floor but I wanted to definitely shout shout that out and, and tell that story that's awesome um, because she shared a, a really a really great story about Nas and and I want to make sure that she kind of got that that story at least got its got its due here on, on your podcast yeah. at least oh, yeah. Oh. yeah thank you thank you for sharing that it's it's a uh, you know i and i think you can echo this um you know from from our perspective particularly when you we've covered nas both of us have covered nas for five years mm -hmm. right and so you develop you know somewhat of a working relationship with these people you're around them all the time particularly you you know traveling to to all to all the road games and it's this interesting like dynamic of getting to know someone without really getting to know anything about them. Right. Yeah. Our jobs are so much to tell the stories about what they're doing on, on the basketball court. And I think it's little, even just little anecdotes like that go, go so far to like show us more about 
who they are as a person and and in that case who they've been you know that yeah. i mean that's that's a decade ago that he that nas was probably in that in that spanish class yet at the same time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to the extent that i know nas like that all checks out to me right. in, yeah. in in my my understanding of 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 who he is um I mean, what what's another uh from the story maybe in the in the process of of Rudy and moving through LSU to to Minnesota with Nas mm -hmm. maybe let's let's talk a little bit more about who Rudy was I thought that was interesting because you told me like hey there's this guy Rudy his name's Rudy like you're gonna think that's <laughs> funny um yeah. but I, I didn't know anything about like who and how Rudy was um, as, as a person, I know you have like in the story, they were the odd couple, Rudy's five foot mm -hmm. seven, Nas is, you know, six, nine, six, ten, or whatever. But, mm -hmm. but who is, who is Rudy Roundtree, uh, as, as a person kind of in, in yeah, he's very, very outgoing, sociable, funny, um, you know, from all, from all accounts, just, a a guy who kind of lights up the room when he's in it with his energy, with his, you know, laugh, Will Wade, you know, Nas's coach at LSU said, you, know, you always heard Rudy before you saw him, like just just a big voice, big laugh. Um, you know, he always had a always had a, a joke ready to tell or, or a funny line. Um, you know, Nas and Sheila told you know they both kind of told this story about how like you know a typical Rudy story is like you know they're walking in a mall or something like that. It'll be Nas, Sheila, Rudy, and maybe some of their some, some of Nas's friends. And Rudy might see, you know, an attractive girl nearby and he'll, you know, kind of elbow the boys and say, hey, hey, you know, look, look at her over there. Look at her over there. Knowing that Sheila is standing right there, mm. you know, just to just to annoy Sheila, basically. Um, and he always had these sort of, you know, kind of, let's say, off color uh, remarks sometimes and, and one liners that were that i some of them i really can't print <laughs> sure um just just jokes and sayings that you know would would have people in stitches yeah. uh that's the kind of guy that that he was from from all always trying to make people laugh a um, lot of energy you know a lot nice just a a, a good dude um you know and always tried to make people feel feel welcome seemingly wow. um you know another part that got cut from the story was um you know uh aunt's business manager and longtime uh coach and trainer justin holland he knew rudy like obviously like the first couple of years okay. that aunt was was in minnesota so so justin got to know rudy a little bit so i talked to him for the story um and just basically you know uh, always would call Justin's kid Hollywood like hey how's Hollywood doing you know like like, like yeah. stuff like that you know and and Justin said you know Rudy was like one of the first people him and Sheila to really make aunt and Justin and everybody kind of feel welcome once sure. Aunt arrived in Minnesota yeah like, I mean not, they were there stuff, a year before yeah, they were yeah. there a year before so you know he said that that you know they were definitely some of the first people that like you know aunt and his crew kind of connected with um when Ant got to minnesota so yeah that it, it's interesting uh in the sense of like you you had the whole you know decision for nas to to stay in minnesota mm -hmm. uh piece of the story and you know obviously just historically the wolves have had trouble uh, attracting and then retaining talent right mm -hmm. and and i think that's a, a good little piece too is you here we go you won it you won the lottery you got you know <laughs> you got your your talent you didn't have to do much to attract them you just had the first pick and you gave it to them but i think nas and and when i i i thought of this when ant did sign the you know the the max extension this summer and how it was just kind of like a you know a no-brainer and and you know to be fair guys almost always do but i i thought about you know, Nas and some of the other guys that were that are still young but have been there uh, before mm -hmm. Ant is just being. It, it makes sense to me that Ant still wanted to be here, you know, and that it was a no brainer. And I think that is because of, you know, the the relationships and stuff that Ant has developed with the Minnesota community and the organization overall. But like, mm -hmm. he's got that crew of guys. We just know from kind of having been around there, the guys that are in Ant's age bubble and Nas is is that as much as anything so I can kind of just like picture all of that of Nas yeah. being like no this is cool here this is good like let's do something here and I think that's why Nas stayed in many reasons for many in many ways is that 
you know, he was a free agent this past summer mm -hmm. and he was on a team that had two bigs in front of him and he opted, you know, to, to stay here and continue growing something here. I think that's of the Nas Reed story. That's um, obviously one of the most unique and cool parts of it. We often kind of refer to it as a meme, you know, and Nas <laughs> Reed, but, uh, but Nas really has come to, be loved here and love that. And I think that's such an important uh, reason as to why he he stayed here, signed that contract extension himself. And now it's just kind of become even more of this uh, phenomenon. And I thought it was, it was just really cool um, at the end of the story that Sheila was there on Nas Reed towel night. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, it just, yeah. What, what, what did that mean to Sheila to be there then? And, and what would have it meant uh, to, to Rudy to, to kind of see all of that that come come together you know I, I, just from a writer perspective i um when when the nas i wasn't there for nas read tell night i had a, a a friend's bachelor party that weekend oh, yeah. that i was in uh, or that i was a part of so i was gone for that weekend but i was due to talk to nas on the monday after towel weekend it was like cleveland yep. golden towel state weekend. Yeah, towel weekend <laughs> Cleveland, Golden State, and then uh, I was set to talk to Nas on Monday, like in late March. So I'm watching from afar. I'm watching on my phone the Cleveland game, and I see the towels, and I see like that moment unfurling on social media. I'm like, oh, wow. I think I've got the ending for this story now. <laughs> that was crazy, <laughs> and, and, man. and so it was, Sheila just said she was speechless. That was the word she used. She just, you know, she couldn't believe it. She it was such a touching, cool moment for her. Um, you know, and she obviously thought of Rudy in that moment. And Nas sitting on the bench during the timeout was thinking of Rudy <clears throat> during that moment too. So yeah, I, I think it I think it's cool that like it, that the fans obviously were showing their love and adoration for Nas as they as they always do, but I just think it's cool in that moment that Nas was thinking of Rudy and Sheila was thinking of Rudy and the fans may not have known that, yeah. but it's kind of how they were affecting them. And I, so I thought it was really cool to just kind of bring it all home with, you know, just the towel moment and <clears throat> the two of them sitting there just thinking of Rudy in that moment um, and what he would have thought if he was, if he was there for that day. Well, now, now the fans do know that, Chris, because of you. Yeah, um, yeah. That's uh, that that's that's really cool, and I, I I hope you know fans as Nas does you know play in the playoffs and and have a real role in this and and find success when he does. You know, um, now we know that you know amongst the other people in his life that have been really important to him, that's a that's another person that that he's going to be you know thinking about in this process probably. Probably at the the top of the the list there. Do you want to um, talk a little bit about Nas in this in this Sun series? I've kind of we, we've done a few episodes, you know, previewing, going over this, but uh, somewhat intentionally because I knew you and I were going to to do yeah. the uh, a Nas read <laughs> episode. Um, haven't talked that much about Nas in this, and I think you know, to use the X factor term. Like I, I, I really do think I do see Nas in this as a, as a really important player, just be one, obviously he's an extremely important player to this Wolves team, but specifically to the part of the matchup that I know you and I have our eyes on, which is the, the difficulty, which is matching up against Phoenix <clears throat> when they have four wings out there and only one center. And what, what Nas is, you know, evolved himself into is a center sized player who can do that, who can take on a wing matchup um, when, when necessary. And, you know, he's been the guy who's chased shooters around. He's had the guard guys like Grayson Allen over the course of this season. Um, he's guarded, you know, those difficult fours, the Zion Williamson's, the stuff like that, that the wolves ha don't have as many answers to for, for guarding and I thought I, I didn't really notice this when we were when that game was going on live on Sunday, the, the game 82. But right when Nas checked into the game, they took Ant off of Durant and they put Nas on him. Mm -hmm. um, Nas comes in for Cat, right? And Cat's on Grayson Allen. Ant is on Durant. And they they put they put Nas on on Durant there. It wasn't Nas didn't have like a, a great game or anything. He had a couple of good possessions, you know, switching on to Booker and stuff like that. But I say that all to mean I think Durant or Nas is part of the answer 
for the Wolves Durant problem um, defensively in, you know, in this series, which is also just the craziest thing about the whole Nas Reed evolution is that I would never have imagined three years ago being like Nas is part of the solution on the defensive side of the ball for the Wolves. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like we, I, right, I believe yeah. pretty early yeah. he was going to be a bucket getting big um, if right. he got the opportunity to do that, but he was not mm-hmm. a defensive player. And now I really, and he has become that. And I think, I think he's part of the answer for, for Durant and to be able to do some of the things that Carl can't do just from sort of a speed perspective in this series. How do you see? I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, defensively, at least he, he does help kind of alleviate some of your concerns on there. And, you know, if, if you think about the starting lineup, it's like, well, can Carl guard Durant? So everybody else can kind of slot in more naturally with, mm-hmm. you know, can, that, that allows Ant to guard, <laughs> excuse me, you know, like Beal and Jaden to guard Booker and Conley can guard Grayson Allen. It's like Nas seems to be more equipped to do that just given his mm-hmm. uh, agility and, and quickness, which is uh, maybe a step quicker than Carl's. So, yeah, and you look back at the the second matchup during the regular season, which was a few weeks ago out in Phoenix, and Carl didn't play in that game. Nas started. Nas had a terrible offensive game. So did so did basically the rest of the team that night. But I think it's easy to forget that the Wolves held the Suns to under a hundred points in that game. Like the Wolves did not play a bad defensive game that night in Phoenix. They played a pretty good one. And the only reason that their defense was bad early on was because their offense committed a lot of turnovers. Right. Surprise. You know, mm-hmm. like that's why they fell into a 15 to nothing hole. Uh Nas was kind of responsible for some of that on the offensive end if i remember. right that's why i think he's important here too is is he did hurtful things in that too the turnovers we've seen him against the does packed in defenses get stripped a lot like Nas, much like ant and carl like i I think he has i think he had the first possession of that game was like they got a steal and Nas was coming down the other end and he Mm -hmm. threw it out of bounds and that just like set the tone for that Mm -hmm. night in phoenix i feel like um but it's easy to forget given that they did get housed in the first and third game so badly on the defensive end of the four, that in game two, they actually did have a good defensive night against Phoenix. Yeah. And I think that's important to remember for for, that, for themselves in this series. Now you can look and say, yeah, Carlton playing that game and surprise, they had a good defensive night. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that as, as we've gotten further away from Sunday, just in my mind, I, I'm becoming more and more, convinced that like they could still match up i think with their regular personnel against phoenix defensively as long as they just clean up the the turnovers yeah. like i i really do think that mm-hmm. priority number one in this series is figuring is taking care of the ball because that'll alleviate some of the defensive issues that you saw pop up on sunday especially early in that game so i want to see if they play a clean game offensively then does the defense start getting cooked? And I don't think it's going to. Yeah. I, I I tend I'm I'm back on the side of like, no, I think that they could actually still defend Phoenix, mm-hmm. even even given the matchup issues. I think as long as they don't turn it over and give and allow Phoenix to get out in transition, um, they're gonna be okay. And I think you know, as, as it relates to Nas, he does help alleviate some of those matchup issues and just his offense is going to be much needed on, on the second unit, especially if Phoenix doesn't really have, mm-hmm. you know, kind of capable bigs behind Nurkic to right. guard him. Mm-hmm. Nas needs to have a big series. In, Absolutely. In a situation like that. So it's huge. He's a huge presence in this series for the Wolves. Yeah. I, I think, I think too, as also having more time to, to have, have thought about this and, and it's, it's a good point that, um, the, the Wolves played better defense in the game that that Cat didn't play. It's also, you know, kind of similarly, we talked about this earlier in the season, um, losing a few games against the Kings when Carl played and uh, winning the game that Carl didn't play in there. Again, mm-hmm. this isn't to say Carl's terrible or bad or anything like that. It's just it presents those type of matchups against teams that have one big like Sabonis or one big like Nurkic you know, and then play four wings, it just forces Carl and Nas to do different things, right? And really defend as a wing, which Nas has just has more experience of this season because 
he kind of has to do that. He's been having to do that on and off the entirety of the year. Carl, it's more specific to the matchups there. And so I say that to mean that, that Nas is an option to go to, and you can feel confident in your ability to guard a more wing heavy team with Nas's presence in, in at the four there too, but also to the Carl side of it, like, I think we, we, and my, myself included, we think about these series as the five starters versus the five starters. Mm-hmm. And it's a bad matchup for the Wolves defensively, sure. but it's the five starters versus the five starters. But the majority mm-hmm. of the game, what, almost three quarters of the game, two thirds mm-hmm. of the game is not played in, in that sort of fashion. Once the lineups start getting mixed right. and you do that, and and in the mixed lineup parts of the game, I feel fine about the Wolves' ability to be able to guard them. One, just because the Wolves are the best defensive team in the league. But when it's not all three of Booker, Beal, and Durant out there, it's okay to have the the two bigs, Rudy and Carl, Rudy and Nas, whatever it might be. And you don't feel that 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 same sort of strain there. So I'm trying to – are those yeah. – times of the game? Yeah. The beginning yeah. of the game, it's starters versus starters. End of the halves, it's starters versus starters probably. For sure the in the fourth quarter. Um, and the Wolves need to have more answers there. But Nas is one of the reasons why they have answers in the middle part of the game. And, you know, maybe you can make some hay there. So if it is the fourth quarter and it's the starters versus the starters and you're at a disadvantage, well, what if you're up by 11 points at that time when you get to six minutes left in the fourth quarter? You got some, you know, margin margin for error. And I think Nas is critical in getting them there. And then also it's not for sure that the Wolves are just going to lose those every single time that, that Carl's out there at the four two. He's a weapon on right, to right. Be able to do that too. So I, th- I think I think if having a week to kind of figure out how to punish Phoenix offensively mm-hmm. with that with that with the starters versus starters lineup in there, I think I think you're going to see Wolves. The Wolves come out maybe with a more focused mm-hmm. offensive game plan for because that's what we've always heard from them is like, listen, if teams are going to go small on us, we got to punish them. Right, and the Wolves have not done that yet. Um, to that to that Phoenix starting lineup, and I wonder if there's going to be a more focused effort to really punish the Phoenix mm-hmm. starting unit on the offensive end of the floor. Don't know what that looks like. It's probably playing through Carl a little bit more as opposed to Ant early on. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, but I think Nas can be a big part of that too when he checks in the game. I could see Nas just you know game one. Like I could I could I could sense a scenario where like the Wolves again come out tight. Maybe there's a couple turnovers early with the starting unit. Just the energy, the it's game one. Everybody's a little nervous. Everybody's a little tight, right. and then Nas comes in and just flips the energy of the game with by hitting a couple threes, making a couple moves. I can see him just being like a tension reliever for game one, sure. just with the way he plays. Um, Absolutely, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what kind of start they have. But if it, if it starts, if it's a bad start. On, on Saturday afternoon, I could see Nas being playing the role of like, all right, guys, I'm checking in and I'm gonna take somebody off the dribble and I'm gonna hit a three and we're gonna we're gonna get back to our normal selves. I could see him playing that sort of role as well. It, it's almost like he has to if they yeah, start yeah. slow. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, because because if it is, if the Wolves do fall back ten, like they have in so many of these matchups, you know, right away early in the game, like you do need something to stop the bleeding there, yeah. and and if Nas can't do that or doesn't do that in in that sense then maybe you know now you now you got a first quarter like the game on sunday where it's 22 to 44 at the at the end of the first um but that's what nods has done so much all season kind of regardless of role regardless of opponent because he is the offensive like when when we think about the wolves needing more offense in this well they need more shooting on the floor more spacing so teams can't load up on hand and a willingness of that big to shoot it as carl needs to do um as well, but Nas can just kind of break that right away in that second half of the first quarter when we know Ant will be in there with him. And then also just the transition gets going a little bit more with Nas. And as we've talked to Finch, you know, about, you know, Ant and them loading up on that, what does Finch say every single time? We need Ant to get involved in more ways where they're not loaded up like that. He always says, we need more Ant in transition. And and when I think of Ant in transition, I normally think of Nas Reed being on the floor too with him yeah. and just kind of that quick pivot from whether it's a steal or not, just getting back, moving the other direction, pushing the defense. It's so important in this series to push the Phoenix defense to points where they can't get set, 
or can't be matched up exactly like they want to. Nas just run, man, and get even get a cross match. Like, get, you know, get a Bradley Beal on you if that's not who they want you to be matching just because you ran up the floor more. Nas mm-hmm. has done that consistently. So you feel good about the idea if it if they are tight, because I can see that too, that he can kind of, you know, stop that. Or if it is close or if the wolves come out, like he's the, you know, he's the next domino that that keeps things moving, moving in that direction. I think he's he's such a big part of the series. Yeah, it's you're right. Whenever you think of Anthony Edwards in transition, I'm envisioning in my mind like Nas Reed just like shading to the wing or the corner yeah. to try to spot up for a three, you know, like how often do we do we see that in the, in the course of a game? And that's how Nas can get some easy, some easy open looks. Um, I, I, I'm going to be fascinated by the by the chess match of, of, of how the Wolves are going to respond. Uh, game one, I, you know, it's going to I think it's going to be a long series. I think we're in for six or seven in this one. Um, I, I don't think all hope is lost <laughs> the, the coming off of coming off of Sunday. Um, you know, now that you have a whole week to really drill down and try to figure out how to defend these guys. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think what gives me kind of a, a, an optimistic outlook for this series is that the Wolves defensively this season, they've been flexible. Like they, they don't just play one way and that's it. And if a team solves them defensively, then Right. Congratulations to them. They they've figured out the wolves, right? The wolves have proven that they are flexible. They they can do different things defensively based on the opponent, based on the matchups. Personnel is a part of that. Um, but the wolves just don't play one rigid way. Yeah. And and I think they're gonna be able to adjust, they're gonna be able to make some tweaks, and I think because of that flexibility they have a chance. Yeah. They have I, a chance to figure this out. I I, I think that is the point to, to hammer home. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if you're a Wolves fan who hasn't watched maybe a lot of games this season, what Chris just said is true. They've mm-hmm. had a diversity of styles in which in particularly, in particular, they play defense. And, and also, and again, or if you're just a fan watching the Wolves in the playoffs for the, for the first time all year too, like there's, one of my favorite things is just like the diversity of lineup concept with this team. And and in part due to Kat's injury, they've had to try so many different iterations of, we talk about Phoenix, like the four wings and the one big, mm-hmm. well, the wolves have gone a lot to obviously the main thing is a two big lineup. Mm-hmm. Um, they've done the four wings and one big thing for, they did that a ton um, when, you know, when, when Kat was out, it was like multiple two, three point guards and, one wing and, and one big um, mm-hmm. they have gone to just Nas at the five. Yeah. Maybe you can call that a no center lineup if, if Nas has moved away from that. And I think that's maybe what people don't know about the wolves is that they have done that this season. That doesn't guarantee that they will execute that and, and, and make it work for, for a win necessarily, but it's not like if the wolves go to, one center looks or no center looks at, at times during the series that won't be new to them, you know? And, yeah. and, and that's, that's important. It would have been last year pretty much, right? It was, everything was so much more rigid the first Rudy Gobert season and, and that the Wolves have been able to diversify this year in many different ways and still win 56 games is, is why you can start convincing yourself into the Wolves winning this series even against you know the evidence of the of the three times that these these teams have played have played this season. Anything else you want to hit on uh, from from the series, Chris, or or another note note from the pod? I just again push everyone to yeah, I to, just to read you know, the story. You talk, you talked about just kind of uh, how you know if the Wolves are up eleven late in the game. That's good for them. I think they're going to have to be up eleven late in the game because I don't I don't trust their late game execution. Yeah, <laughs> especially compared to having Kevin Durant and Devin but they've Booker been bad in fourth Bradley. too. Yeah, they, they have been. been. They have. I just, I just wonder though in the playoffs. Like, I, I, agree. I agree. You know, like I feel like that's going to be. I think not. Not that you can throw the regular season numbers out because I think with the Wolves you can't throw the regular season out and how bad they were mm-hmm. uh, clutch time offensively. But Kevin Durant has a long 
history of playoff experience to draw from and anthony edwards has two series right um it's not that's just facts that's just you know mm-hmm. ant has been very good in his playoff career but when the late game execution has to happen are they going to be able to clear that hurdle and mm. that's where i'm maybe the most pessimistic about sure. the wolves in this series no i'm opti- I, I'm, 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 I'm more optimistic the other 43 minutes of the game right but when we get inside the last five i don't mm. know how that's going to go yeah and and i think it's to the phoenix side of it too is they have struggled at times when not all three of their big three um, could were, were available for the game, right? Yeah. If it was just mm-hmm. two of them, they struggled. And then there's just been a handful of games where one of the three of them is just not there. You know, like yeah. whatever in terms of their effectiveness. That was Bradley Beal, I think, more more than mm-hmm. anyone else. But there's been, you know, there's been fourth quarters from Kevin Durant where even you know where he was you know non-existent or Booker missed shots. Like, can you punch back? You know, and and while everyone's expecting you to reel in late game execution, can you do something uh, yeah. to make to make the other team start reeling? We will see. Uh, we talk about this 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 series a lot. Um, it's it, I think we're ready to have a, have an actual basketball. Let's do game. it. Let's get Let's to do game it. one. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Um, yep, Saturday uh, at two thirty. Do mm-hmm. make sure um, in in the time before that to uh, to read Chris's story. It was really well done uh props to you props to the star tribune and everything they they put into that happening uh these type of stories don't exist without work and time and resources and effort um put into it so uh yeah big big hat tip to you though judging by Appreciate how viral it. your tweet is of of that going <laughs> on i think many people have already have already read this story. yeah very very happy with the response um i'm glad people have, have gravitated towards it um really makes the the work that you put into it, you know, that there's that there's a reward on the other end of it. So appreciate everybody that has read it. We'll read it. Um, it's been it's been great to see. You should you should absolutely uh, feel good about it, and those of you listening should absolutely uh, go go read it at the Star Tribune. He's Christopher Hine. You can follow him on Twitter at Christopher Hine, um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Dane Moore MBA. You can follow our our socials: Instagram, TikTok at Dane Moore MBA underscore podcast. Um, all, yeah, all, all postseason. Uh, if you're not a Twitter person, we're putting up like my tweets and stuff from the games with quotes and stuff on the stories. And, um, it's a good way to, you know, stay, stay in touch with this. Uh, next up for us with, on the show is, uh, the live show at, at falling knife on, on Friday night. That'll probably, probably be up, um, Saturday morning and a couple hours there to listen to it, uh, before the game, um, at, at two 30, uh, yeah, let's do it. Playoff time. Uh, we'll, we'll see what's next. Chris will be there uh, in Minneapolis and in Phoenix. Thank you for doing it, Chris. Um, until the live show at, uh, at Falling Knife, he's Chris. I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man, I hope it never stops, yeah. Green and hot so you can find me in the crowd, yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever, ever bring you down, yeah.